Welcome back to the Daily Traders Podcast. This is episode number 35, and today we have a very special guest, Jared Tendler, uh, who is internationally recognized uh, as a mental game coach. Jared, it's great to have you. Welcome to the podcast. Yeah, good to see you guys. Good to meet you. Thank you so much. Pleasure to have you. Um, So I'm really excited personally for today's episode because we haven't really worked with any type of psychology. As we know, mental game is wildly important in trading. I feel feel like now our podcast has branched out more into the entrepreneurship space. So having someone who's involved in performance psychology is going to be really, really cool. So before we begin today's episode, I just have to say that we are not financial advisors. All right. We cannot give any financial advice. Nothing said in this podcast should be taken as financial advice. The full disclaimers is in the description below. Let's get right into it. How did you get your start in performance psychology? You're a golfer, right? (laughs) Ex-golfer. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm still playing at a high level, and I actually signed up for the uh, U.S. Open qualifier this year. Oh no uh, way! Wow. You know, wow. still trying to play at a high level myself. I don't, cool. I don't want, I don't want my clients to have all the fun. <laughs> uh, but I mean, I wanted to play professional golf. I mean, that was my my goal, uh, my dream as a kid uh, growing up. And so um, I got into this because in 1997, I tried to qualify for the U.S. Open and uh, missed the playoff. Uh, by a shot to move on to the second stage, oh my God. which is effectively like a small PGA tour event because only about 80 players qualify automatically. There's like 65, you know, spots left open for basically anybody, right? There's yeah. about 10,000 people that, that sign up. Anyway, long story short, I played some of the best golf of my life, but missed, you know, putts of this length mm, wow. uh, too many times to to get myself through. And so like, you know, you choke once fine, but then the USM a couple months later, I choked again. So then I started realizing like, you know, there was more than just, you know, my physical abilities that were going to kind of come into play. So I dove into golf psychology and, you know, my game steadily improved throughout college. I was a three-time All-American Division three Skidmore college, won nine tournaments. So, I mean, I could get it done in kind of these smaller venues, but, yeah. you know, playing in some of these big national events, like all that work still kind of went out the window in these big moments. And so I kind of reasoned that a lot of the golf psychology that existed at that time, which frankly, I think is evident both in, in poker psychology and trading psychology and really mm-hmm. a lot of general uh, performance psychology, uh, even, even to today, it, it just like it, it gave you an understanding. It gave you a philosophy. It gave you some perspective, but it didn't often get at the heart of what was causing uh, those, those problems, especially for me. So I kind of diverted my, my dream and, and, you know, went and got a master's degree in counseling psychology, got spent two years, 3,200 hours getting licensed as a therapist. Wow. Right after I got my license, quit my job, moved to Arizona and started building up my golf practice, working with, you know, junior golfers, you know, good amateurs and even some, some tour players and, you know, kind of steadily built up my roster uh, and began kind of building up my kind of approach, which you know, kind of borrow from sports psychology, borrow from, you know, kind of traditional therapy and kind of combine something that ultimately uh, proved to be more powerful. Now, it wasn't early on. I mean, I, I thought I was better than I was early in my my career, but it wasn't until I met a poker player and began kind of diving into professional poker where my skills as a coach really kind of took off, which is, you know, kind of ironic that um, that, that would occur because at that time, I actually had started playing some professional golf tournaments. My game, I kind of had solved all my mental issues mm-hmm. and yeah. was playing some of the best golf of my life. But, you know, if you're going to try to make it as a PGA Tour player, it's going to cost you about, you know, a quarter million dollars over three years. And like, it's not like I just kind of had that money sitting wow. around. I mean, I could have gone for, you know, look for investors. But the irony is, right, that like diving into poker was kind of the safe bet. Um, at that moment, because <laughs> there was no like real traditional golf, uh, you know, yeah. poker psychology that was like the mainstay. So I kind of had an opportunity to become kind of like the standard in the in the industry, and and that's what I set out to do. And yeah, obviously, still play golf at a high level, but um, you know, that's kind of how I got my start. Wow. I'm going to quickly interrupt. I'm really excited for you guys to listen to the rest of this episode, but I have to thank our sponsor, thedailytraders.com. Now, if you guys are interested in learning how to trade in the stock market and having access to see my exact trades, 
That's right, you're gonna get access to an entire series of educational videos breaking down my entire trading system and at the same time, be able to watch me on a week-to-week -week basis trade in the stock market. Go ahead, click the first link in the description, apply discount code PODCAST99 to get $100 off. Interesting. Cool. I, um, I've done a lot of talks with like, with Steve Hawkins and last a uh, few weeks ago we had on Sonny Harris. She said that, you know, a lot of traders are, are either like musicians or athletes. Is, um, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah. And there are a lot of them are, are poker players too. I've mean, worked yeah. in institutional space yep. and you know, they, they often are looking for ex poker players. And so, yeah, why are they musicians, athletes, poker players for one, you, you have to have a, a real understanding of training and development and growth and like what it takes to develop skills. I think a lot of traders, especially young ones, or ones who have come, let's say kind of like they're really like in the middle of a career, you know, or, you know, let's say 30 years old, uh, and they've got a job trying to transition to trading. There's no barriers to entry. Like you've got a thousand dollars, you got $10,000. Like you can start trading today, which is like the equivalent of just like jumping into a PGA tour event, having never played golf. Mm -hmm. I like that. Like, I mean, good, trading example. is the most competitive industry in the world. It's the NFL on steroids. It's the PGA tour on steroids. Mm -hmm. And people think that they can just like, Oh, here's some money. I'm going to go compete with everybody else. I mean, there's no flipping chance. Mm -hmm. Now you can get lucky early on. Sure. I mean, anybody can get lucky. Yeah. Right. There, it, it, but like to turn it from, you know, the, the game being a, basically a casino to you being the house and you being the casino takes a ton of skill and athletes and poker players and uh, you know, musicians, any performers really uh, they've, they've gone through a process. They understand how to develop skill. And, and a lot of traders, I think really underestimate the amount of time and effort that's required. You cannot become a trader in my opinion uh, with less than one year of experience. Um, you can trade. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. But that doesn't make you a trader, right? You, mm -hmm. you don't have the skills and the knowledge base at that point. So yeah, you've got to put the time in and, and kind of learn, you know, get your degree in a sense um, before you can even really become skilled. Totally. I really like that analogy because it's, this kind of got me thinking, um, like in golf, you know, I've hit some really good shots, like right, right up under the green, foot away from the hole. And then, but my scorecard's still above an 80, right? And it's, it's it is about consistent. You can get lucky. And I think a lot of people get lucky in trading early on. They think they're it. They're going to make a million dollars in a month, whatever. Um, it may be, but you talk about the development of the skills, but where does the development of the mental game and the, the you, I don't want to use controlling of emotions, but managing your emotions come and play. I mean, let's, let's get even more accurate, right? So, um, managing or controlling your emotions is a short term tactic mm -hmm. for me, right? Emotions are an essential asset to leverage as a trader, as a golfer, right? As an entrepreneur. Yeah. If you're not using your emotions, then you have no motivation, right? Motivation is an, an emotion, right? Passion and love. These are powerful emotions. These are powerful drivers. If you are bored or disinterested or distracted, or whatever, like your energy is low, mm -hmm. it is going to cost you significantly, equally as much so as having too much anxiety, too much nerves, too much anger, too much confidence, right? Euphoria, right? So what we're looking for is not to view emotions as good or bad, right? We're, we're, we need emotion to fuel us, but where emotion becomes problematic is when it's either too high or too low. There's something called the Yerkes dodson law, right? And if you can kind of imagine like an upside down U, right? In the bottom left corner, emotion is low, you suck. On the bottom right corner, emotion's too high, you suck. Yeah. It, we're looking for that balance. And that balance, you know, is different for everybody. But, you know, some people are kind of, they need a little bit of anxiety to perform well. Some people need yeah. a little bit of anger to perform well. You know, think of like the Michael Jordans, the Tiger Woods of the world. Like they need, right, that kind of aggressiveness uh, and 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 sometimes anger, right, to to actually fuel them to be at their best. We're not going to qualify that as right or wrong. It freaking works, right? Mm -hmm. So, what is the goal with kind of developing a mental game strategy? It's to understand your own emotional state, right? How it aids and sometimes um, hurts your performance, your decision making, your execution, and when it's excessive. It's being fueled by underlying flaws, biases, wishes, illusions. Yeah. Right. And they are the problem. Right. If you're walking down the street and you feel pain in your foot, is the pain the problem? Mm -hmm. No. The pain is the signal alerting you, hey, 
idiot. Like, look at what's going on here. Mm-hmm. And and so emotion that is problematic, like anger or anxiety, is alerting you to look and understand why, right? Your emotions are that intense. And if you do that, you can devise corrections that then go like kind of transcend the management or control of emotion and instead actually solve problematic causes of emotion so that you can just be free to trade, right? Knowing that you're using your emotions properly because they they ultimately will be part of intuition, part of your high level sensation, right? When you develop enough skill, right? If you're a trader with less than one years of experience, do not trust your intuition. <laughs> it's wrong. You don't have enough knowledge or experience yet. Yeah. Okay. But once you've developed enough knowledge and experience, that intuition is going to help you, right? You're going to feel a little bit greedy at a time when like all things are go. You can't fully articulate what that means. Or you might feel a little fearful, and that's actually accurate reflection of what you're sensing in the market and how your positions line up. Like high-level traders use that all the time. Intuition is key, but it's it utilizes emotion, provided that emotion is kind of clear. Right? We don't want your mind clouded with a lot of negativity, a lot of excessiveness, and that's I think ultimately what we're trying to do is clear that crap out, so you're you're kind of freed up to to trade at your best or to perform at your best. Okay, interesting. So correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like step one is actually being aware of your emotions. And then step two is realizing what is causing these emotions. And then step three is actually acting on it to fix whatever the problem is. So for example, there's a thorn in my foot. Step three, step one is realizing, oh, this hurts. Step two is realizing, okay, I have to take this thorn out of my foot. And then step three is actually taking the thorn out of your foot. Is that right? Yeah. So let's refine it slightly. So step one, like, I don't love the word awareness. Like awareness feels passive to me. Like, oh, I'm aware that I feel bad. Yeah. You need to know in real time that a certain signal, which could be an emotion, could be a thought equals that you've, de- that your, your, your mentality has deviated. So for example, let's, let's take like FOMO, which I'm sure is a common problem. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. So when you have a particular thought, like, Oh, I wonder what X, you know, symbol is doing today, right? But it's sort of outside of your purview, but you know that historically, let's say like Tesla, right? Wildly moving stock, lots of people make a lot of money, lots of people lose a lot of money in that stock, but there's a lot of interest, but you have decided that that's not part of your day-to-day strategies to trade to, 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 trade Tesla. If you have the thought about what's going on in Tesla, that is a signal that greed or or FOMO, right, has has started to creep up. So we want to create a recognition that a signal, mental, emotional, physical, behavioral, right, equals that your emotional state has deviated. So recognition to me is a more powerful term okay, like because that. it creates that kind of connection. Yep. Once you've recognized it, then yes, you want to better understand what the hell is causing it. That right? makes Dig in, figure out what the, what the real problem is, and then that is what we are correcting. FOMO is not the problem. FOMO is the symptom or the signal of a problem. Okay, so I'm going to reframe my next question I was going to ask. So how do we, I feel like it's easier said than done to recognize, recognize our emotions because I remember as a beginner trader, I would just blow through the day. I would trade here, there, whatever. Sometimes I'm greed, sometimes I'm red. You know, especially at the start, I was mostly red. Um, but how do we start recognizing our emotions? Because I feel like that's a lot easier said than done. It's super easy to just go, do what you do, and then not take any value from this. Seems to be pretty, and as we've established, pretty important uh, input of information. It is. And and so the the easiest way to kind of begin is to think of it like a skill. Yeah. Right. Recognition, even self-awareness, right? Again, I'm not opposed to the word awareness. I just think it's weak. Yeah. But either way, right? is it's a skill. You can develop it over time. And so to me, the best way to start that is something I call, at least within trading, like like data collection. I've got a worksheet on my website that's freely available. It's a data collection worksheet. And literally what you're doing is throughout the trading day, you are writing down notes about specific thoughts that you're having, triggers, right, for certain emotional states, right? You start to feel a little greedy, you start to feel a little revengey, a little angry, frustrated, irritated, nervous, right? Like, you're tracking that stuff. You're tracking behavioral signs, right? All of a sudden, my, you know, my 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 the the grip on my my mouse is starts to get a little death grippy. I can feel tension in my head, mm-hmm. right? I want to punch my monitor. I'm now looking at like all these different positions, uh, changes in how I'm thinking about my positions, right? My perception of the market, right? Now I'm I'm starting to feel like I can predict 
you know, market movement. Well, no, right? You, you can't. But if I think that, then that's an indication that maybe I'm getting overconfident. Mm-hmm. So point being, right, we're, we're actually writing down all of these data points throughout the day. Now, you do that on one day, does that mean you've solved it? You, you kind of have developed recognition? No, just like you can't develop skill as a trader in one day, but you do this day over day. Not only are you going to build the skill of recognition, but you're going to be able to do a more refined version of that first step of becoming uh, kind of more tuned in and more better able to recognize is to map your pattern, right? To actually write out. So for FOMO, for anger, for anxiety, right? Is, you know, from, from like one to 10, 10 being the most intense you can imagine, from one to 10, can you actually describe different levels of intensity, of FOMO, of frustration, right? When yeah. typically it crosses like level five, that's when things really snowball and get out of control. And you're no longer, you, you might be aware of what's going on. you aware that you're doing something stupid. You shouldn't, but you can't stop it. Why? Because your emotions have taken hold. So the recognition of the early signs becomes so critical to actually being able to act on step two and three. In real time, right? Can you stop yourself from making a bad decision? You can't once the emotions have gotten too high because the part of the brain responsible for controlling emotion is shut down by emotion. Oh, okay. So Can you I will say that again? Yeah. This is yeah. this is a sadistic, crazy thing about the brain. And if if everybody that's watching this burns this into your brain, you will you will live a better life for this. Okay. So many traders I work with who are much older have developed a lot of self-criticism and a lot of negativity because they're expecting themselves to control their emotions at times when the brain literally does not have the capacity to do that. Yeah. Okay. Prefrontal cortex is shut down when your emotions are too high. That's the part of the brain that is, is controlling emotion. So you have to recognize that, that emotional state early before that part of the brain shuts down. Otherwise, it's like bringing a water gun to a gunfight. Like you are going to get mowed down. Can you explain more about how the prefrontal cortex controls emotion and its role in like decision making? I mean, I'm not a neurologist. I just know that that structure exists. Mm-hmm. But if we take a brain scan, like you look at like the top of, of somebody's brain. Yeah. Right. It's a it's a little kind of spot in the front and it will be red hot if somebody is actively trying to control or suppress their emotions. However, like once that emotionality rises too high, then that part of the brain is no longer able to function. So look, I mean, the prefrontal cortex is part of the frontal lobe. Frontal lobe includes just like thinking, right? If you have a thought in your head, right? We call that, you know, working memory. Mm-hmm. Well, working memory, you know, we don't really know what these structures really are, right? It's just, we all experience this stuff and we just come up, come up with names for it. But it's kind of like having a whiteboard, you know, in your mind where you can have these thoughts and move things around. Yeah. But that part of the brain will shrink over time. So in a normal state, you can think about seven things on average at one time, right? Now, the average is seven. It ranges between like nine and five. This is actually why phone numbers, uh, at least in the US, um, have seven digits pre uh, area codes back in the day, because AT&T did this research and they found that people could recall uh, a seven digit uh, string of numbers. Point being, right, that that number of seven is going to shrink over time. Now, if you think about actively trying to control or suppress emotion, so now let's say that that number has gone from seven to five, and out of that working memory, you are now utilizing some part to say, oh, like, of you know, don't think about Tesla, right? I know this is bad for me. Like, I, I need mm-hmm. to stay focused on my positions, and yeah. so now you've you've chopped out. Now now you're down to four, maybe three. Mm-hmm. Out of that other you know, three or four is still the impulse of like, oh man, but, but everybody else is making money. I could still, like, you know, you've got like two data points left to actually make trading decisions. It's insanity, right? So the point being like under this state, you are very likely to make mistakes, right? And and Mm -hmm. if you're expecting yourself to be in control of your emotions at these times, you are setting yourself up not only to make big mistakes, but also to vastly misunder uh, like misinterpret what's happening and blame yourself and 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 create a lot more chaos than than is really necessary okay so i have a question then um so with paper trading what's your opinion on that because obviously there's no emotion when it comes to paper trading and emotion is wildly important to become a successful trader so is paper trading good is it bad just what are your thoughts generally 
Yeah. Like a lot of things, there are no kind of hard lines mm-hmm. of good and bad. It's like, how do you use it as a tool? Mm-hmm. Right. If I'm a new golfer, right. Am I just going to throw myself on the golf course every day? Hell no. I mean, mm-hmm. I, you, you are going to get, you're going to extri- experience a lot of anxiety or a lot of uh, emotional chaos just from being out there. So no, I need to be, you know, on the driving range, finding a place to practice. Mm-hmm. I need to have like a more comfortable, relaxed environment to get my feet weight. So paper trading is a great way to get started, provided that, you know, as a new trader, you understand that you are not trading. Mm-hmm. Paper trading is not trading. The driving range is not golf. I was going to say that. That's funny. Right. Okay. So paper trading is is a, 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 a tool to learn the mechanics of trading, to understand and begin to kind of create some pattern recognition, mm-hmm. to test out uh, strategies and develop some competency, right? It's to, to build that knowledge. But uh, and not until you are actually trading in a live market, are you beginning to experience like what actual trading is like. So if you go into the to a simulated environment with the understanding that that is what you were doing, that this is not trading and there's, there is no equal sign mm-hmm. right, between paper trading and live trading, you understand that firmly, yeah. then you're going to have a much better experience. And then what you can do is um, kind of bounce back and forth between the two. So you start trading position sizes that are small enough that you can afford the risk, right? It's it's like really at this point, you're kind of paying for your tuition in a sense. And and it's it's fine, like it's it's capped, right? Uh, and then you kind of go back, bounce back and forth. So what you, what you will do is you'll you'll create some uh, like mental and emotional data points of, oh, okay, when I experience, when I feel, when I see this kind of a setup coming, like I just become really itchy and I jump in too soon. Mm-hmm. So then you go back and paper trade and you try at that point, now having had that experience, to make paper trading more like real trading. Treat it as if it is your actual capital on the line and you're trading the sizing that is, you know, kind of equal to uh, what you were doing in the live market. And then you kind of bounce back and forth and develop a strategy to deal with that that impatience, that intensity, and then bring it to the live market and see if you can make some pro- progress there. But, you know, paper trading, I think the, the, the way that people, I think, use it wrong is to spend too much time there. And of course, to think that what they're doing is actually going to have any equal, uh, you know, uh, uh, impact on on their actual trading in the live market. Uh, that's okay. really that's really awesome. interesting. Well, that was uh, some great insight on paper trading. Yeah. We're actually going to cut to a quick break here. Uh, stay tuned for the second half. We're going to get onto some actual tools and actions you can implement today, tomorrow to further your mental game in trading. So we'll see you guys after the break. We hope you guys are enjoying this episode so far. It is officially halfway through. So we have to take time to thank this episode's sponsor, thedailytraders.com. Now, if you guys are interested in learning how to trade in the stock market, the first link will be in the description where you're going to get access to see my exact trades in the stock market and access to over 30 plus educational videos breaking down my entire trading system. So use discount code podcast 99 to get a hundred dollars off and with that said let's carry on with the episode if you're enjoying this episode we would greatly appreciate it if you could simply leave a like comment review on spotify apple wherever you're listening to this episode uh, it helps us out more than you can imagine and we put a lot of work in these so again it would mean the world back to the episode all right and we're back after a short break i hope you guys are enjoying the episode this is a great one so far so we wanted to kind of transition and talk more about trading specific and jared how you've you know started working with traders and seen their curve and defining balance uh and you know going from wherever their progression is mentally, how you gauge where they're at mentally when they start out uh, through the process of you working with them and then getting to them to that, getting them to that point where they need to be to perform at peak performance. Yeah. So whenever I work with a new client, I have them fill out a very detailed questionnaire. Um, what I found in my career is if we were to just like sit down and just start talking uh, and I ask them all the questions that were in the questionnaire, I'm going to get at best about 80% of the information that I need. Interesting. But if you ask somebody these questions in a relaxed environment where they can kind of think in advance, you know, their mind is going to, you know, just be able, because it's in a way like a session is kind of a performance in a sense. And if they're mm-hmm. feeling any pressure from the first in, first meeting, anyway, long story short, questionnaire kind of allows us to both get prepared so mm-hmm. I can create a game plan, you know, for that first session. So I already kind of know, you know, kind of what buckets we're dealing with, right? Is this somebody that's dealing with more anxiety or fear or confidence issues or motivational issues, focus issues, et cetera? And, and you know, beginning to kind of formulate what are the underlying causes of that, right? What is the, the, the real cause of those pain points? 
because that's generally kind of where my skill set is is the greatest relative to my clients, right? You know, the, the delta between me and them, it, you know, kind of firmly fits in the like my ability to pinpoint like the underlying causality has been my greatest growth over you know the now eighteen years that I've been coaching. Um, as much as the system is there. So like the system is not that complicated, right? It's I lay it out in the book. We've talked about it already today, but the, the ability to kind of take the signals of FOMO, anger, et cetera, you know, what I see in the questionnaire and like understand that underlying causality is kind of where my skill is the greatest. So, you know, in that first session, we're kind of trying to figure out what that is. I'll give you some examples of some of these underlying flaws. Cause I think when, when we look at, um, you know, your listeners like actually trying to begin kind of helping themselves, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times it's still weird to think about, oh, well, if emotion is not the problem, like what is? And so here, here are the problems, right? So one problem would be um, expecting trading to be easy, yeah, right? That's a, that's a, a flawed belief or expecting to make easy money, expecting to make a lot of money. I think a lot of traders, uh, new traders, um, you know, what, let's even just say that you made a million dollars, you know, by the end of, of, of April, let's mm -hmm. say, um, nobody thinks about what's next, right? They think about making a lot of money, but they don't think about preserving it or what happens next. And so, you know, that is a flaw in and of itself, right? You can, you can aspire to make a lot of money, but you have to begin kind of thinking about the next steps because the way that you aspire to that end is defined by what your goals actually are. You know, other flaws include uh, hindsight bias, right? So you kind of in the rear view mirror know what you should have done, know how you should have reacted, know what should you what trades you should have taken, mm -hmm. but that doesn't generate any foresight. And so it, it's actually a bit overconfident and and almost arrogant to think that oh now I know what I should do, and the reality is you don't, right? Mm -hmm. Until you can prove that you can have the foresight to act differently, to think differently, to trade differently in the future then hindsight is just, uh, you know, a, a form of mental masturbation, right? You're, you're, you don't really actually think you're not actually able to do this in reality yet. It's just in your own mind. Okay. So, uh, hindsight bias, confirmation bias, like the need to be right is very strong. People yeah. want to feel good about themselves. They want to feel competent. And that, that kind of flies in the face of like the markets, right? The market is going to tell you, you are wrong frequently. Sometimes you are actually wrong. Sometimes you're right and just not getting rewarded for it. How you differentiate that is really, really key. And so if you have this inherent need to be right versus an inherent need to learn, to grow and to be successful, slight, slight, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, adjustment in, in mentality, then you are going to um, like re-enter trades multiple times to try to prove that you're right or uh, do other things that are kind of outside the boundaries of your strategy. Um, expecting perfection, you know, perfectionism is a huge one, uh, one that can cause a lot of, you know, mental and emotional chaos. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like new client, we're trying to kind of work through all this. And, you know, in the book, I talk about um, 18 different traders who I worked with, who were able to have success. And there's one I want to highlight here because we're talking about, a you know, kind of this underlying causality, but sometimes the, the real cause is actually just a misperception. So we talked earlier about how, uh, you know, trading is the most competitive market in the world competitive well it, it's going to generate a lot of in, just inherent intensity in its own right right yeah and so for me when i was competing you know in that us open qualifier one of the flaws that i had at that time was thinking that the fear and nervousness and and literally kind of handshaking that i was experiencing was bad versus understanding that that was an inherent quality of being in this situation uh -huh. that were i not to feel that way would actually be a bigger problem. And so by thinking that intensity and nervousness is bad, you then start to create more layers of emotional chaos because you're trying to get rid of it. You're trying to calm yourself down when your job is not actually to calm yourself down. Your job is to actually infuse yourself in it deeper where you can still have all of that inherent intensity, but not be distracted by it. So wow. the, tra the trader that I'm talking about, right, early on, he didn't recognize that the fear was really just some signals of some weaknesses in his strategy. Mm -hmm. So he was too caught up in how he was feeling, trying to get his emotions lower, not realizing that they were actually being caused by, you know, he was a relatively discretionary trader, but there was room to become more systematized, you know, around certain types of entries. And by actually taking time to think about how to be more precise with those entries, the fear went away. 
in a, in a, in a problematic way. He still felt the intensity of getting into a position because mm-hmm. he cares. His money's on the line. Right. And, and, and so we're not trying to quite qualify that, that fear as being bad. We're trying to qualify it as being something that is an essential component mm-hmm. and that when harness actually can fuel you at your best. Okay. So you kind of just touched on some of the more emotional pitfalls of traders, such as unrealistic expectations, looking back at trades and saying, oh, I should have seen this. Now I can do it in the future. Um, There's a few other ones. What are the emotional characteristics of traders who are actually successful? Like, What are the end goals um, that traders should be working towards emotionally? For example, uh, one uh, mental characteristic that I've noticed in uh, successful traders is the ability to not have uh, or, or not get personally attached to trades and be able to switch their conviction like that. So what are some mental goals that traders should have and that you've seen progress in your clients that you've taken on that have gone from, you know, uh, whatever their starting point is to becoming more uh, mentally capable traders? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of those individual kind of uh, mental uh, perspectives that I think you know, kind of really blend strategy and technical abilities, right? It's like kind of how are you thinking about this enterprise? Um, I think great traders have the ability to have what I would call stable confidence where, you know, individual outcomes do not kind of move you even, you know, days and weeks where, you know, the results are poor. Mm -hmm. If you know that your execution is quite high, then that's not going to influence your, uh, you know, like what comes next, which for a lot of traders means, you know, panicking and, you know, watching hundreds of videos on YouTube and looking for, you know, answers to kind of solve this quickly. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not really, you know, evident of somebody that has a lot of conviction in what they're doing, right? Great traders develop a strong fingerprint and how they see and understand the market, how they understand how to profit and generate an edge, right? That's how you become the casino, Mm -hmm. right? Casino's edge and, you know, a slot machine is anywhere between, you know, eight and 13, 15%, right? It's like profit margin in a business, right? As an entrepreneur, right? What is your profit margin of your business? Are you a high margin business or are you a low margin business, right? The bottom line is understanding where your profit comes from is your edge. And when your edge is not being rewarded, right? This is what makes trading and poker so difficult because you are going to go through periods where the probability is just not going to reward you. And then you're going to go through periods where the market regime has changed. You don't know know what the hell is going on, right? And it's going to take you some time to make some small adjustments without wildly and dramatically changing uh, your, your tactics, right? So- Great traders have the stability. They have the independence in their mind to be able to read what's going on without having it change what's what they're doing internally. Now, a tool that I use, which is again freely available on my website, is something called the A to C game analysis. Mm-hmm. Okay, so like what you are literally doing, it's a different form of mapping uh, from what we were talking about before. Here, you are trying to describe your A game, right? You at your best, your B game, you know, your average performance, and your C game, you at your worst. Now. You might add additional categories, which is fine, right? Some traders, you know, add in the zone. They might do A plus or A minus B plus. I don't care. You have to have at least three. You can't just have A and C, which is what a lot of traders end up, you know, feeling like they have early on, right? They're at their best or at their worst. It's not true. You have a B game and that understanding of B game is really, really important. But where this cl- this classif- classification comes in really handy is it, it gives you a non-monetary way of measuring your performance, okay? If you know that you're in your A game and you know that generally your A game is profitable and you are losing money, guess what? Don't do anything different until you get enough evidence to understand what you could do to change your strategy. You know, if you are in your C game and you are making money, do not be excited. Be fearful because you are going to get punished, you know, if, if not tomorrow very, very soon. So the bottom line is when we can create these independent ways of measuring ourselves separate from P&L, separate from monetary results, Mm -hmm. you create more stability in your performance. And I think that is an essential component. So, you know, I'm not giving you a kind of a wide variety of examples here to your question, but I I think this is the most important one to have. It's something that all great traders have to some degree. By all means, I know many of great traders who are wildly, you know, attached to results, but they're able to, you know, still kind of harness their uh, mentality so that th- that emotionality actually doesn't affect their decision making, which sounds weird, right? You can be mm-hmm. raging and still not making mistakes. That That is, you know, kind of next level stuff. I would not suggest anybody who's new to the game to uh, expect to have that uh, that skill quite yet. Totally. Let's talk more about this A, B, and C game because as a ex, I, I competed at a very high level um, for ski racing. 
And I remember like some days I would show up and I would feel like I'm on my game. And sometimes, some days I'd feel, like you said, some days I'd feel up like, okay, I'm feeling all right. And then some days I would be like, what is happening? I'm not on my game. And it's the same thing with trading. Some days I show up, but like, I feel like I have a pulse in the market, which now I know is an emotion I should look into. Um, or some days I feel like I don't, I don't even know what I'm looking at. So where, obviously it's a complicated topic. And for those who want to learn more, I encourage you to go uh, read Jared's book. But where do we start to define it ourselves? Because correct me if I'm wrong, but my A game is going to be different from your A game and your A game is going to be different from Mark's A game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but there's a, there are a lot of similarities, right? I mean, yeah. you know, we think about like kind of peak level experience, right? You look at the the book flow or peak, like top level experience tends to have a lot of markers. Now, that's from a mental and emotional standpoint. From a technical standpoint, yes, like what am I seeing in the market? How am I thinking? What, what indicators am I using? What positions am I uh, looking to get into? You know, those are going to differ wildly. But you know, again, same same process. Like you can do the data collection, right? You can kind of track your performance day to day and just be honest with yourself, like kind of where you're at, at at different points in time and writing down the specifics of what's going on. You know, there's a blog that I wrote uh, this month. So we're in February here. You can go back to it. It's, it's on the topic that I call suck less. So we're going to talk about improving your performance over time. It's not just about moving that A game forward. It's also about improving that C game, right? And if you are not improving your C game, then you're missing a a big opportunity because by and large, right? If you've got a decent amount of experience as a trader, poker player, et cetera, your C game is almost entirely caused by some mental and emotional flaws. Okay. So therein lies the idea that when we get kind of hard on ourselves for making C game errors, you do not want to just like dive in and learn more about the markets, about positions, about indicators. You instead want to focus more on the mental and emotional flaws that actually caused you to be at that level. When you're in your A game, your me- my, your your mentality is actually you know for you at that point like perfect, right? You are at your ideal. Mm-hmm. So if you're making any mistakes, those mistakes we can classify purely as learning errors, right? These are things that could not have been avoided because you are in an ideal state. So if you're going to make a tactical tactical error or a technical mistake, it's because you they just didn't know something. So getting hard on yourself at that level would be like yelling at an infant or yelling at a toddler for falling when they're learning to walk. Yeah. Like what kind of a-hole would do that? Right. But that's what a lot of people are. Like they, they have such small tolerance for mistakes or losses that even when they're at their best, they're going to be really hard on themselves. The, The B game is kind of the intersection where there's some emotional, mental, emotional degradation. Like you're, you're not quite on. And then there's course, you know, things in your, in kind of tactical and strategic game that you want to be working on. Your B game is where you should be focused from a day-to-day standpoint in terms of what you are working to improve on, mm-hmm. right? That is the bulk of what's going to help you to suck less, right? To avoid C game and, and help you to continue to progress at a high weight, high rate. But again, not a lot of people think about it in these terms, but that that's where you want to kind of, you don't want to, you want to understand the factors that produce your A game so you can help to encourage it more often. But the A game is, it is fickle, right? You, you can't expect it. You expect it. It's gone. Yeah. Right. And so to, to get that at that level quite consistently requires a lot of work. Um, the, the bulk of your work day to day in terms of your improvement should be in your B game. Okay. Can you give us like a real life example? So for you, when you're on your A game in golfing, what does that look like? Or a traders that you maybe have worked or some of your clients that you've worked with, what does it look like when they're on their A game? And what does it look like when they're on, or let's use use an example. Like what does it look like when you're on your A game in golfing, B game in golfing, C game in golfing? And how do you uh, distinguish between the three? Yeah. Okay. So when I'm in my A game, you know, playing golf, right. My, my, my pre-shot routine is precise. It's very easy for me to uh, kind of mentally go through all the the data points that I need to make a decision. That decision is made quite easily. I automatically have like an athletic or intuitive response to that, which allows me to I think to to f- like kind of get the shot in my body. Right for me, I need to make golf really athletic, like to make it not something that is purely cerebral. Mm-hmm. Right once I've kind of found my target and figured out what I'm going to do, it it really is just going to get over it and and go. Um, but right when when I'm in my B game. Uh, I might have a little bit more kind of uncertainty, like what the wind is doing, what is the ball going to do based on this lie. Um, I might be a little bit tired or distracted. And so as a result, I'm not going to really kind of hone in on exactly like um, how far, you know, the ball is going to go in the air, uh, what shot I even want to hit, whether it's, a you know, something that's low or high. 
Uh, when I'm in my C game is even more of like kind of like an autopiloted thing. Now, back in the day, I was dealing with more pressure and fear and things like that. Mm-hmm. Loss of confidence for me now, right? I mean, maybe a part of it is because of just like lifestyle. Like I'm not trying to become a professional golfer, but I am playing at a high level. Um, my C game is actually more uh, like a, a result of not enough focus, right? My my intensity is not high enough mm-hmm. to get me locked in. So yeah, like I'll I'll just kind of like autopilot certain parts of my routine and just get over a shot and not really fully understand what I'm doing, knowing in my head uh, you should back off and still hitting it anyway. Yeah, uh, and so that that's me for golf. So when I think about like some of my my trading clients, right? There's a there's a there is a lot of feeling of decisiveness, um, clarity, uh, like patience and poise, calmness, but not necessarily like a relaxed calm, but more of like uh, like a present uh, poised calmness in their A game. You know, C game is like it runs the gamut of like every little, you know, mental and emotional issue you can imagine from, you know, all the ones we've mentioned today, plus including, you know, procrastinating on, you know, doing extra research or, you know, skipping warm up, skipping, you know, post market cool down, uh, things like that, not taking breaks throughout the day, mm-hmm. uh, being, you know, a uh, like aware of things that I ought to be doing, but not really doing it, right? Similar to me in golf. Uh, and then B game you know, will include like kind of more fogginess and cloudiness, a little bit less decisive. Uh, there might be uh, instances where there's like a little bit of frustration, not really that consequential, a little bit of fear, um, you know, slight deviations in per- in terms of performance. Um, yeah, so that's probably the best way to determine. All right. Well, that's a great topic to kind of wrap things up on. Um, Jared, thank you so much for coming on. I love this episode. Yeah, yeah, I wish we could keep going. And I, mean, I, I do too. I really <laughs> wish we could keep going. Maybe we could do a part two. Uh, but hey, where can people find you? Yeah, happy to do a part two. Um, so my website, jaredtenler.com. As I mentioned, there's you know a bunch of free uh, resources there. There's also information on my coaching. Uh, I've got a, a trading psychology masterclass that's out as well. Um, and I also have uh, you know information on where to get my books, which... You know, basically anywhere you buy books, it's there, uh, including Audible, which, you know, is quite popular these days and probably the, the best selling version of the book. Um, although I will say tra- oftentimes people will get the audio book and then get either the soft cover or Kindle because there are, you know, it's I wouldn't call it a, like a book that you're just going to kind of read cover to cover. It really mm-hmm. is like a resource. So if you're going to use the book in to me, the optimal way, it would be to go through it all the way once. So you've got the full overview of my system understand kind of how you're going to begin problem solving and then go back through selected passages that, you know, you really need to kind of hone in on a key on and, and like just watch or, or you know, listen or, or read those sections, uh, you know, repeatedly. Makes sense. Uh, Cause it is more of a resource than it is a pure book. Awesome. Uh, I mean, I'm on, I'm pretty active on Twitter uh, at Jared Tendler. Um, yeah. And then I've got, I do have a, like a monthly newsletter so you can sign up on, on my website and kind of keep tabs on all things that I've got going on. Awesome. All right. Awesome. And guys, Great. by the way, um, hopefully live this Friday, uh, dailytraderspodcast.com will have all of our show notes moving forward. So you'll be able to find his links. I'm hitting the character limit on the podcast platforms, which is why <laughs> I've decided to do this. So all the links will be there. Yes. Yep. And um, I'll make sure I just get your website in there for sure. Um, all right. Thank you, Jared. We uh, we appreciate it. Thank you guys for watching yeah, this episode. Seriously. We hope you guys enjoyed it and we'll see you all in the next one. Pleasure having you, Jared. Have a good one. Thanks, Jared. All right. Take care, Jared. Take appreciate care. it. Thank Bye. you. Have a good one. Once again, I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. I personally love this episode. Did you like it? Yeah. That was awesome. Um, But real quick, if you guys could just simply leave a comment, review, like the show. We put a lot of effort into these episodes. So if you guys got any value out of this episode, you enjoyed it, please, please, please leave a like, comment, review. Helps us. Subscribe. Thank you. And see you in the next one. Later.